hearing will come to order, and we thank you all for your patience as, as we had some, some votes that have, have just concluded. Uh, the subcommittee meets today to receive testimony on the impact of recent initiatives that affect the capability of the Department of Defense to acquire and manage information technology systems. The advent of the information revolution has not only changed how we as a nation do business, but it has significantly impacted how we provide for the common defense. Information technology includes everything from hardware and software to data standards to commonly agreed upon architectural frameworks and has completely permeated the national security enterprise. Uh, in at least the information technology portion of the budget that's been submitted by the President, it's uh, approximately $38.5 billion. Uh, so a, a not inconsiderable sum of money. Obviously, we're interested in how that money is spent, whether it's a spent efficiently. Most importantly to me is, is whether it enables the warfighter to do what uh, we ask them to do. Uh, but as you all know, this subcommittee is also particularly interested in, in the security of our systems this year and cybersecurity uh, for the nation. And uh, so we are interested in uh, what we're buying and, and how secure it is. So we appreciate uh, our witnesses and the, the ability to uh, discuss this topic today. And I would yield to the ranking member, the gentleman from Rhode Island, for any comments he'd like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd also like to uh, welcome my witnesses here today. Uh, it's good to have the Honorable Elizabeth McGrath and the Honorable Teresa Takei uh, here, and I look forward to their testimony. The issue of information technology is critically important to the Department of Defense, and I want to thank Chairman Thornberry for calling uh, this hearing. IT is a, is a crucial factor in every aspect of the Department's activities, from the routine email uh, to the flight controls of the most sophisticated fighter jets in the world. The Department depends on the smooth functioning of myriad IT systems. As the information age matures, we find that IT systems have expanded in both complexity and pervasiveness. As a result, today they represent one of the largest investments for the Department, and they present a significant potential vulnerability if they should fail or be attacked. The business complexities are uh, only made worse by the evolving cyber threats that have begun to challenge the integrity of our current systems. Therefore, it is important for the Department to, prop to be properly organized and pursue IT acquisition, implementation, modernization, performance evaluation. Oversight is required for the full spectrum of activities, but bureaucratic redundancy creates confusion and complexity. Now, the DOD IT enterprise must be as streamlined and efficient as possible. I understand this part of the Secretary of Defense's efficiency initiative will see some changes in how the Department manages IT and perhaps some cost savings along with it. Now, this is welcome news, provided it achieves the desired effect without reducing capability or injecting unnecessary risk into the process. We must also be vigilant uh, that as we uh, move forward, the security of our systems is at the forefront uh, of our efforts. Our acquisition systems, furthermore, are, are barely suitable uh, to uh, large-scale uh, weapons projects requirements for IT systems uh, that involve rapidly, and the systems need more flexibility if it is to manage uh, proper acquisitions of these systems. Um, as Mr. Thornberry mentioned uh, um, previously, last year's 2010 National Defense Authorization directed the DOD to develop the, and implement uh, a new acquisitions process for IT, and I certainly look forward uh, to hearing uh, more about how uh, that process is proceeding today. Uh, with that, uh, I yield back and I look forward to our witnesses' testimony. So I thank the gentleman. Uh, it would be no surprise to you all that there are a number of meetings going on now, including a Republican conference on, uh, on the the uh, funding situation with the government, uh, so we may have members coming in and out at, at, at strange times, but I appreciate your patience with that. Witnesses today, as, as the gentleman mentioned, is the Honorable Teresa Takai, Acting Assistant Secretary of Defense for Networks and Information Integration and Department of Defense Chief Information Officer, and the Honorable Elizabeth McGrath, Deputy Chief Management Officer of the Department of Defense. Uh, without objection, your full written statements will be made part of the record, and uh, you're both uh, certainly welcome to summarize them in any way that you see fit now. Thanks for being here. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Langevin. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Defense Department's efforts 
to improve its business operations and specifically its acquisition and management of business information technology systems. As the DOD Deputy Chief Management Officer, I am responsible for instituting a framework to define clear business goals, develop meaningful performance measures, and align activities through established and repeatable processes. The purpose of DOD's overarching management agenda is the, is the establishment of an effective, agile, and innovative business environment that is fiscally responsible. The Department has taken decisive action to improve its business processes, has identified areas where further work is required, and has several achievements to bring to your attention. My written statement addresses these in detail. I, re I will briefly touch on some of these topics as I am eager to discuss with you the areas that interest you most. I would like to highlight our IT acquisition reform efforts, other business IT initiatives, and successful cross-agency management efforts in which my office plays a key role. Fundamentally, the Department's business IT systems are essential enablers of a broader set of integrated business operations rather than an end unto themselves. We have identified 15 essential, what we call end-to-end -end processes such as hire to retire and procure to pay. Our business enterprise architecture and senior governance bodies, including the investment review boards and the Defense Business Systems Management Committee, uh, both given to us by Congress, uh, are better aligned to manage within the end, -to -end, within the end, -to -end construct to identify uh, data standards, performance measures, and policies necessary to improve our business and make more informed enterprise-wide decisions. And to end focus and strong governance are joined by a new approach to acquiring information capabilities. There has been no shortage of studies and reports, including one by this committee last year that concluded the Defense Department's method, current method for acquiring IT systems must change. Steps are being taken to address these issues. Section 804, to 804 the fiscal year 2010 National Defense Authorization Act, required us to develop and implement a new IT acquisition process with its focus on the Department's IT Acquisition Task Force, uh, which I chair. The guiding principles adopted by the task force incorporate recommendations from the Defense Science Board report, including deliver early and often with delivery capability in 12 to 18 months, incremental and iterative development and testing, rationalized requirements, tailored and flexible processes, and finally, knowledgeable and experienced information technology workforce. I welcome the chance to elaborate here on how the task force is addressing these areas. Uh, we expect to promulgate these in a policy later this year, such as establishing metrics to assess overall health of a program, combining certification and accreditation with traditional test and evaluation activities, and assessing contracting strategies that enable a more modular delivery of capability. Our pilot-based approach to validate these new policy this new policy will allow us to modify as necessary based on lessons learned before the final issuance. We are currently testing these changes to ensure they are working. The Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics signed out new acquisition policy for defense business systems called the Business Capability Lifecycle, or BCL, which provides a streamlined framework for development testing, production deployment, and support of a defense IT business system. The principal focus of business capability life cycle is program implementation. In my written testimony, I have an example of an Air Force program uh, that was originally on a, a path to deliver capability many years out uh, using innovative uh, streamlined approach. We were able to move that deployment uh, two years earlier. I also welcome the chance to describe for you our cross-agency efforts in modernizing health information technology and security clearance processing. In particular, the Government Accountability is Office removal of the DOD Personal Security Clearance Program from its high-risk list is a significant first for the Department and owes its success to our commitment to, the, to this results-oriented end-to-end approach. In closing, we are committed to improving management and acquisition of IT systems as well as its overall, our overall business operations. These issues receive significant management attention and are a key part of our overarching strategy to build better business processes that will create lasting results for the men and women in uniform. I look forward to continuing our work with this committee and in the months and years ahead as we work toward greater efficiency great, and effectiveness and furthering the agility in the business space of the department, certainly enabled by modern interoperable IT capabilities. I look forward to your questions. Thank you.
Thank you. Mr. Kai. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Congressman Langevin. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today on the importance of information technology to the transformation of the Department of Defense. My testimony today will focus on how the DOD is leveraging information technology to securely deliver mission-critical information capabilities to the men and women of the Department of Defense and our mission partners. The Department's FY12 IT budget request, as you mentioned, of $38.4 billion includes funding for everything from our desktop computers, tactical radios, identity management technology, commercial satellite communications, and the large information technology projects, some of which Ms. McGrath spoke of. These investments support mission-critical operations that must be delivered in an environment of ever-changing requirements and ever-increasing demand. Where in the past the Department sought to balance the need to know with the need to share, today the warfighter expects to have and needs to have the latest information in order to complete the mission. That coupled with the increasing use of social media, smartphones, and tablet computers has made information sharing an expectation. And this requires new capability, particularly at the edge or in our tactical environments that have limited ability to availability of persistent and broad range uh, network capabilities. Our challenge today is ensuring our networks can securely support the information demands of our users who require that information anywhere and anytime across our enterprise. To meet this challenge, our networks must be designed and optimized to more effectively and efficiently support these mission operations while ensuring security. DOD networks are under constant attack from cybersecurity threats launched from the Internet or from malicious software embedded in email attachments, removable media, or even embedded in the hardware the Department procures. Every device connected to the network is susceptible to cyber vulnerabilities. While working to efficiently respond to the information demands of our users, we must be ever vigilant in protecting our information environment. Just over $2.8 billion of the Department's overall budget is devoted to information assurance or cybersecurity activities that defend our information systems and networks. The Department's FY12 Information Assurance Budget Request ensures increased funding to address insider threat and cyber vulnerabilities, such as those identified in the WikiLeaks incident. Specifically, we have requested funding to support the deployment of a public key infrastructure-based identity credential on a hardened smart card for use on our secret classified network, a successful technology very similar to the common access card we use on our unclassified network. We have also identified funds needed to deploy our host-based security system to secure our classified systems to provide an automated capability to continually monitor the configuration and security of our networks and improve identity management across the Department. The DOD is planning for the investment and implementation of these IT and information assurance capabilities within today's current resource-constrained environment. Recognizing this, in August, the Secretary directed a number of initiatives to achieve savings in acquisition, sustainment, and manpower costs, while not degrading our ability to execute our mission. Among these is the consolidation of our IT infrastructure, while simultaneously defending that infrastructure. My office is responsible for leading the development of a strategy and plan for consolidating the Department's IT infrastructure in five broad areas our network services, our computing services, application and data services, our end user services, and our IT contracts and purchasing. I plan to issue the DOD IT Enterprise Infrastructure Optimization Strategy this quarter. The plan represents the Department's strategy and initial roadmap to achieve the goals of improving our effectiveness while heightening our security post our posture. This plan commits us to changing policies, cultural norms, and organizational processes to provide lasting results. The initial focus is on ob obtaining tangible results in fiscal years 11 and 12 while planning for aggressive consolidation through FY15. It really positions us to embrace emerging technology and provide cutting-edge capability to our warfighters. 
The transformation of our IT capabilities described above is a very ambitious undertaking, one that will reap tremendous benefits to the Department and our Nation when completed. It will require agility as well as new processes to both keep abreast of technological advances and defend the network. My office is working closely with the Office of the Deputy Chief Management Officer on efforts to develop a flexible, agile acquisition process that also addresses the DOD's requirements and budgeting processes. As you know, we have also been addressing the development, education, and continuous training of our workforce. The Information Technology Exchange Program pilot reauthorized by the FY10 National Defense Authorization Act for DOD is one mechanism that we are pursuing. Under this collaborative effort, we have a pilot which will involve 10 individuals exchanging both industry and department uh, expertise to enhance our employees' IT competencies and technical skills and infuse both DOD and the industry with new ideas in this fast-evolving discipline. My office is responsible for implementing ITEP, and we have created a guide to assist participating DOD components with the implementation. Maintaining an information advantage for our users is critical to our national interest. The efforts outlined in this brief will ensure that the Department's information capabilities provide better mission effectiveness and security and are delivered in a manner that makes the most efficient use of our resources. I want to thank you for your interest in our efforts, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Uh, let me start out with, I guess, some, some rather broad kind of questions. Uh, Ms. Ms. McGrath, about 10 years ago, Defense Science Board did a study that, that found 16 percent of all IT projects complete on time and on budget, 31 percent were canceled before completion. 53% were late and over budget. Um, only, let's see, of those that were completed, the final product contained only 61% of the originally specified features 10 years ago. Uh, how much better is it now, do you think? From a percentage perspective, I don't think I would be able to uh, articulate percentage-wise how much better I think it is. Um, I do think that the department is taking a more holistic look at how IT fits into our uh, broader capability needs. Um, I, I would say 10 years ago, we would have a, a handful of people who are interested and focus on how IT worked and enabled in the entire environment, and today we're taking a much more enterprise uh, perspective. I can talk about the, the many uh, studies and reports that have been done in terms of the, how the acquisition process needs to be better uh, to enable the, a, a more rapid capability and delivery of, of the information technology. Um, the maintaining a standard, stable baseline of requirements uh, I think can be found in every single one of the studies and reports that have been completed. So a lot of the focus of the department, not only on the IT side, but the weapon system side, has been to identify and stabilize those requirements such that we can meet them in um, a more, um, um, I'm going to say, to chunk the capabilities such that they're um, delivered in a spiral fashion and, and not try and solve the entire issue at, at the get-go. So I, you know, percentage-wise, um, specifically, I'm not sure how, how to counter those numbers that you articulated, but I can say uh, certainly within the last uh, five years that there's a lot more management attention and focus on the, the requirement stabilization, the spiral implementation, um, so that, that I do feel that it, we're moving in the right direction. Okay. And, and I want to talk more in a minute about some of the acquisition points that you make. Um, somewhat on behalf of one of my colleagues, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, from time to time, we've asked about the ability of the Department of Defense to withstand an audit. And a lot of the question, uh, the answers that have come back to me over the years is, well, we just don't have the computer systems that can talk to one another, you know, so basically the business systems were not compatible in order to put all the pieces together. Now from, and I, I realize you're not the, the, uh, the, you know, it's not your responsibility to audit the department, but just from the business systems technology part of this, where are we now? So the, and I would agree, the systems, um, 
uh, were designed very locally and not with a broader auditability target in mind, um, uh, nor with a common architecture framework in mind. And so they were local solutions to handle local problems to do the sort of the math, if you will, uh, uh, accurately. Um, the today the the environment is very different with the uh, business enterprise architecture uh, standard um, financial information so f standards a standards based approach to implementing uh, these enterprise resource planning solutions we have many ERPs uh, within the departments that will contribute to the department's ability to achieve uh, uh, financial auditability and they are they are a very key factor in our success in that pursuit. Um, and we do recognize that it is a business goal, a broad business goal, not just an IT problem, nor is it just a comptroller problem, that, but it is a shared responsibility across the functional um, space, meaning, you know, logistics, personnel, they all, um, uh, they all have a part because their transactions are where it all starts and then uh, end up in the financial system at the end of the day. So we are taking, a, again, a very deliberate uh, cross-functional enterprise approach to um, not only the IT aspect of it, but the business process um, because it requires change in, in all those areas. Yeah. Well, I know there are a number of people on, this subcommittee, on the committee <laughs> as a whole that uh, wants to hasten the day when, when that is possible. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Kyd, I guess the, the, the first question that leaps out at me for you is, do you have the authority to do your job? Uh, you look at, and you said, I think, in your testimony, we're, this includes everything from radios to laptop to the desktop computers. Uh, all of those spending decisions are made by the services or other entities. You're there kind of to help coordinate or strategize or guide. Um, but they don't have to listen to you. And so answer, do you have the power to do your job? Well, that's, uh, there, are, there are a couple of answers to that question. So let me phrase it in a couple of different ways. Um, certainly while the budget dollars for the information technologies expenditures are in the services, there are any number of the processes in the building that actually review that spend where my office has a major role. Um, certainly in the requirements process that Ms. McGrath talked about, not only from a business system standpoint, from also the standpoint of, to the point of uh, command and control systems, for things like tactical radios, my office is involved in the review of those programs and certainly have the <coughs> opportunity at that time based on a technical review and based on just an overall project review to weigh in on those projects. Um, so there are those processes. There's also um, obviously our investment process through the CAPE organization where we look uh, early on at our investment decisions. So while, in fact, we don't control the overall budget, um, there are requirements and investment processes, and then ultimately in the acquisition process, uh, we are also a member of the groups that actually review the projects going through. So we do have opportunity, certainly, to uh, weigh in. The other piece of it is that in our responsibilities are very definitely to set policy. And in setting that policy, we are doing that, as I mentioned in our IT consolidation plan, in ways that actually direct the expenditure of the dollars, uh, even though it resides within the services. And, do you, and through these various committees and all this stuff that you set on, uh, let me ask this, how often is your organization's judgment overridden, would you guess? I wouldn't have a good view of that. Um, I'm fairly recent, as you know. I joined the organization in November, uh, and so don't, you know, ha actually have very real specifics or percentages or anything at that time, at this okay. time, to be able to give you. Okay. Um, this on on the integration 
strategy that's coming out this quarter, is that going to be classified or unclassified? No, it will be available, and certainly as we complete it, it would be something we would very much like to share with you. But there will not be a classified version of it? No. Okay. Okay. Mr. Langevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, I want to thank you both for your testimony here today. Uh, Secretary Takai, I want to thank um, you for what you've had to say today. I'd like to in particular discuss a, a major concern that, uh, that I have about the Department's Information Technology Consolidation. As you're aware, the Chief Administration, uh, the Administration's Chief uh, Information Officer, uh, Vivek uh, Kundra, if I pronounced that uh, correctly, is, uh, instituted a, um, a Federal Cloud Computing Strategy in, in February, uh, which mandated that all agencies modify their IT portfolios to fully take advantage of the benefits uh, of cloud computing in order to maximize capacity, uh, improve flexibility, and minimize cost. Now, while the benefits uh, from cloud computing are, can certainly be great, I believe that uh, the security of cloud uh, architecture is, isn't fully understood and, and remain very concerned that uh, organizations may ignore security concerns in an effort to rapidly glean the vast cost savings available uh, from my migrating uh, to the to the cloud. So further, the discussions of uh, specific items such as uh, how uh, the cloud how cloud computing will affect law enforcement and intelligence organizations hasn't also been fully analyzed uh, as well in depth. Now companies that suggest cloud server farms can be adequately secured overseas are really aren't discussing the complex requirements for background checks and foreign uh, servicing personnel or uh, our ability to work with foreign governments to access data harmful uh, to the U.S. when it resides on the, uh, the same server amongst benign data from a, uh, from a foreign country. So, Madam Secretary, with these concerns in mind, what assurances can you uh, give this committee that all aspects of security will be considered, discussed, and planned for in advance of DOD's IT mi uh, migration to the cloud? Uh, and, uh, and second, as DOD begins its migration, is there a discussion of where data farms will reside? If so, does that discussion include the Department of Justice and members of the intelligence community? Well, thank you very much for that question, because I think there is a significant amount of confusion as we talk about cloud computing. It has a tendency to mean different things to different people. So I think it is very important. Um, you know, while we certainly agree with um, Vivek Kundra's assessment that there are opportunities, we also believe that we have to look at the way we move to the cloud in several different ways. Um, and security is actually our paramount concern in terms of the way we look at cloud computing. So let me put that in our overall context. Um, our initial look at moving to cloud computing would be to look at what we call a private cloud. So it would effectively be taking the benefits of cloud computing, but rather than looking at how we would buy that service outside, to look at the way we would standardize our infrastructure, the way that we can utilize our organization, uh, the organization like DISA, uh, which has several large computing centers today, um, and actually be able to bring in uh, implementations from the services, for example, be able to get the cost effectiveness, but at the same time be able to assure the security. So, for instance, right now, Army is looking at a number of applications that they will be moving into a cloud where we will have full control of the security, including uh, the points that you raise as it relates to the security required for employees, where we actually locate those centers, and also the information that we have in those centers. So our initial foray, again, is to ensure that security is our number one concern in terms of being able to move forward. And I think, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, um, while, in fact, efficiency is extremely important to us, we have to be sure that both from a security and protecting the warfighter that we are fully capable. Now, there will be instances, and we are looking at those now, where we will be able to use commercial cloud providers. But when we do that, um, and in fact this is a conversation that I think um, uh, Vivek Kundra is looking at as well, we will have to be sure that those providers meet our security standards before we will utilize those services. Uh, and then lastly, we are looking now, uh, because we believe that there may be a few 
uh, instances where we can go to a public cloud, but they would be for um, those things that don't require uh, the kind of security on our networks and from an information perspective. And uh, so those are the ones that we're taking a look at as well. So I do think, you know, while we're looking at this, it is important to put it in the context of the different types of cloud computing environments and the fact that we're actually driven in terms of our making the decision by our security concerns uh, and our standardization issues as much as certainly from the standpoint of efficiencies. And in that, so in that process, as you're moving toward uh, the, the, the moving to the cloud architecture, will that include discussions with Department of Justice and and also members of the intelligence community? Absolutely. Uh, one of the concerns that we have right now, in fact, is being able to take a look at our information sharing capability um, across the networks that the intelligence community is interest is is responsible for and the um, cybernet and NIPPERNET that we are responsible for. So as a part of our ongoing planning, it is very important that we are well coordinated with the intelligence community. Um, and as they are looking at where they are moving forward, I think in conversations I have had with them, certainly security is also their number one concern. Um, in answer to your second part of the question, which is Department of Justice, obviously um, with some of the challenges we have had from an insider threat perspective, it is very important that they be involved in any decisions we make about the location and uh, the configuration of where we put our information. Okay. Um, if I can continue. The, uh, another area of concern is DOD's ability to continue its information uh, sharing efforts. Um, as we are all aware, uh, the 9-11 Commission highlighted some serious interagency deficiencies at uh, the, the, the time of sharing of sense information. Since that time, much of the Federal Government has made significant improvement. Yet I am concerned that the insider threat uh, type setbacks, such as the WikiLeaks affair, uh, is going to hamper further efforts to improve the sharing of threat and intelligence, informa intelligence information across the, uh, the spectrums of, of threats, both physical uh, and cyber, uh, amongst agencies. So, Secretary Takai, uh, does the DOD have the, uh, the capability to track inside of threats to our information systems, particularly those uh, processing uh, classified information. And uh, what, uh, what effect has the WikiLeaks uh, case had on our information sharing efforts, both internally as well as uh, interagency? Well, let me answer that, um, first of all, by saying we are continue to be um, focused on information sharing. And it has been a major concern for us to ensure that we can do that information secure sharing in a secure way. Because, as I mentioned, we feel that certainly for the warfighter, the need to have access to that information has never been more important than it is today. So what we take as our responsibility is to be sure that we can do that information uh, sharing in a secure manner. Uh, and that is really why I mentioned several areas of technology that we are implementing so that we can continue to do that sharing and yet do it in a secure way. One of the tools that we are deploying uh, at this point in time is our host-based security system. Um, and that is really, again, in response to your question about uh, knowing who is on the network and knowing who has access to information. We have two additional tools that are going to be very important in actually uh, helping us with that. Uh, we are currently um, testing a tool and plan to roll out a tool which will actually detect what we call anomalous behavior. Um, so to your question of do we know who is on the network, yes. And then what we need are tools that begin to detect where there is access to information that looks different than what we would expect to see and then will trigger um, our ability to get in and take a look at that. Um, then we are deploying uh, much stronger identity management capability so that we will be able to tag information to particular users and then be able to continue to protect. Now, while these technology and, and enhancements are extremely important, we also are improving our processes and our procedures for access to that information. So I think, as you know, uh, we have put policies out about the use of removable media, uh, 
But and to ensure that the warfighter has the capability to see that information, we have also instituted processes, for instance, which is a two-person rule around access to information so that we are sure that there is always a check and balance when there is the need to know. Um, so again, to summarize, the challenge for us is to put the technology in place, but also because there is never a 100 percent solution, uh, to be sure that we also have the policies and the processes in place uh, to be able to manage our information. Okay. And I have, you have, you want to do another round? Okay. Yeah, I have further questions, but uh, thank you for that, and I will wait to maybe a second round. Uh, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. West. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Ranking Member. And ladies, uh, pleasure to be here. And uh, Secretary and Honorable McGrath, um, I spent uh, you know a few days in the, in the military myself, and and I can tell you when I first came in, you know everything in the artillery was charts and darts, and now everything is is computerized. And of course, I was in Desert Shield, Desert Storm, where you stood in line for about three hours to get the you know a two minute phone call. Um, I've been spent two and a half years in Afghanistan. I can tell you from the experiences then uh, to now, uh, information technology and the network systems that we have deployed in these combat theaters of operation are, are just incredible. But one of the things that I know that we have to also be able to do is protect those systems in a combat zone, which is something we experienced for about 48 hours in Afghanistan. I think you know what I'm talking about back, I believe, in 2006, and we are able to trace that back to a very interesting uh, country. So one of the things I look at as we go probably from you know so much of nation building, so much of occupation style warfare, and we get back to maybe power projection, forcible entry, more austere environments. Uh, what lessons have we learned in the, uh, the operations in Iraq, the operations in Afghanistan that will make us better prepared, make us uh, you know, more secure with the implementation of our network systems uh, as we move forward, you know, Libya, Tunisia, who knows where is next? <coughs> Well, just some examples, uh, I think, to add to um, uh, your comments, which I think really do reflect the changes that we are seeing uh, actually in theater. Um, first of all, we are seeing very definitely that um, we, our need for network security going forward needs to, to include our coalition partners. Um, and so what we saw in Afghanistan was the need to actually put a network in place. Um, that allowed for each of the coalition partners to have their own secure network, but at the same token have a network which was protected at the point that each of our coalition partners connected to it, so that if, in fact, we had an issue at any of those points in time, we could then block that and not have that impact the entire network. Um, one of the things that we see going forward is that we have to be cognizant of several things. Number one, what I just mentioned, that while we might not uh, necessarily deploy the technology in the next conflict in the same way we did in Afghanistan, we certainly would deploy the concepts uh, that we are using there, again, because of the coalition. The second piece of it is that um, what we have seen is the need to share information, and this really gets back to some of the other questions, across our unclassified and classified networks. Um, while we have seen that in the past, I think we haven't seen it to the extent that we are seeing it today. And so our future networks will need to plan for that level of information sharing. Um, and then lastly, these tools that we are putting in place now um, are really aimed at being able to better secure these networks when we go in. Um, and then finally, what we what we're really recognizing is that we have to standardize our networks because it's not just the networks, but it's what folks want to connect to the networks, and they are bringing any number of devices. They are familiar with devices, commercial devices, that just weren't yet even things that were conceived of being used uh, in theater, and they are bringing them with them. They are used to them. They don't stand in line to make a phone call. They have a device in their hand. You are absolutely right. We have to recognize that that is the situation, but the challenge for us is ensuring that when they do have access to the network, they have an access to the network in a secure way. So it isn't that everyone can bring anything they want, but they have to have that capability, and our networks have to be secure enough to sustain that. 
And uh, Ms. McGrath, a uh, question. You know, after, in the aftermath of what we saw with the WikiLeaks, uh, have we gone back and really looked at our, you know, security clearance processes? Uh, you know, have we gone back to some type of retraining, recertification process? So with regard to the um, federal investigative standards, those have been looked at by both the um, um, the security ex executive agent, which is the director for national intelligence, and also the suitability executive agent, which is the director for office of personnel management, uh, to ensure that when we're pursuing either a hiring action or a clearance determination that we have done the appropriate level checks for the level of access or job that that individual will have. Um, so we we have, from a federal perspective, not only just DOD, but this is a, a much broader federal, um, paid attention to the information that we gather to ensure that we are uh, collecting the right information to make those determinations. And, and we also uh, applied some of the sort of innovation and technology to that process because historically it has taken much, much too long to obtain a security clearance. So we did, through process analysis and innovation and technology, apply those appropriately uh, to the process to enable speed without degradation to quality. Thank you very much, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Ms. McGrath, and thank you very much, both of you, for being here, Ms. Takai. Um, one of the discussions that we've been having in the Personnel Committee over quite a number of years is bringing together the electronic records, of course, of the DOD and the VA. And I, I see that in your written testimony you alluded to that, and I, I'm sorry I wasn't here at that time. But could you please share with us, it, it's my understanding that there are three options that they were looking at, and how is that progressing, and um, what, what are those options, I guess, and um, what, what does the timeline look, for, look like um, that might bring uh, us to a, a decision? So the the options the the they you're you're referring to my assumption is uh, both the uh, secretaries Gates and Shinseki uh, recently met actually it was on uh, March 17th we gave them a presentation we did look at options uh, in determining our collective way forward for electronic health records one was uh, looking at upgrading our existing capabilities uh, DoD uses Alta and uh, the VA has Vista as their is their major IT system. Uh, the other was taking a joint approach to a, I'll use the term single solution, but I really mean single approach to capability delivery. Uh, and the other one was pursuing our own separate um, IT capability initiatives with a bridging mechanisms uh, to share data, which is m mostly how we interface and exchange information with VA today. So so those were the options that, that were discussed with the secretaries. Uh, the, the decision um, was that uh, we agreed to use a common architecture, common data services and data centers, uh, and it would be a standards-based approach to exchanging data as opposed to the interfaces that we do today. Um, so it would be a data-driven approach to information exchange. Um, we have looked at, the, we have agreed to joint development slash acquisition, and it's probably more acquisition than development because there's a lot of commercial off-the-shelf capabilities of a number of the functional areas like pharmacy and labs and those, those kinds of things um, uh, for an integrated electronic health record. Uh, we will look at um, using commercially available solutions first. Um, adopt an application if one of us has a best of breed that we're currently using, and then finally, the, our last option would be we would would develop it. Um, in in saying that, the the difference really is that we're taking a um, a lighter architectural approach. So, uh, as opposed to a heavy systems based approach, today our data and system are very much integrated, and so it limits our ability to be agile and exchange at the data level. The the major difference in the approach that we're taking is exchange at the data level. Uh, it will require us to develop this common architecture. That is, is a significant difference in how we do things today. Um, governance will be key going forward, uh, having the effective governance in place to ensure that we uh, stay aligned to the agreements that have been made by the secretaries. And um, also with regard to the capability we've currently deployed in the North Chicago um, Medical Center. 
Um, we've agreed to pursue any capability that's not yet delivered there, uh, pharmacy and consults being the major two, to pursue those jointly. Uh, saying all that, those are the agreements that we reached. Uh, we have a comeback to the secretaries, both secretaries, uh, early in May, uh, we, where we are to deliver more details with regard to the implementation uh, timeline. Are there any st steps that either the DOD or the VA are taking now um, where their efforts essentially would um, would not be very productive if they if they move ahead in, in the separate ways that they've been moving all these years. I guess are there certain investments, certain expenditures that are moving forward uh, in the different architectures that would not necessarily mesh with what with what may eventually be the. So the message is to ensure that the um, uh, investments that we're making in today's environment are needed to to. Uh, are needed today. And if there are things that we can um, uh, defer such that they, we ensure alignment with this integrated electronic health record, that's what we'd like to do. Um, it, North Chicago is a really good example. Each of the departments was pursuing a separate pharmacy solution that would uh, interact through interfaces. Uh, we have stopped those separate um, development efforts, if you will, to ensure that uh, we pursue. Do you, do you, I guess, can I ask you, I mean, uh, given, given the cultures mm -hmm. and, and given the difficulty with getting to this place, what, um, how successful are we going to be? So um, I mentioned the governance. Governance is key. And the agreements by the secretaries and then the persistent engagement by the secretaries, I think, will be key to enabling success here. Um, both secretaries have agreed to continue to uh, monitor the progress that the two departments are pursuing. Um, in addition to the deputy secretaries of, of both organizations and our uh, joint chiefs of staff. If you were overseeing this uh, as, and as a committee, what would you want to see in three months and in six months from now? Where should we be? So I would ask um, those things that we've currently agreed to with regard to the data standards and data center consolidation. Uh, certainly we should be able to provide plans on um, and interim milestones on where are we to achieving those goals. I certainly would ask for those. Uh, those are things we will be delivering to the, the secretaries. Uh, and we will need those in place to then be held accountable to managing toward um, you know, to achieving the overarching goal. And I think that as we define how we're going to pursue different capabilities, uh, certainly, you know, cost and schedule for all those are, are absolutely what I, what I would ask for. All right. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, as, you, as you can sort of sense my <laughs> impatience here, because uh, aside from the fact that it's very costly, uh, I think just to, to the government, to, to all of us, uh, it's also costly to the warfighter. And we know that we've been working at this for a long time. So I'm, I'm really hopeful that we can have a deliverable soon. And I would just like to add, we, we do, between the two departments, share so much uh, data today with regard to the, the medical. I mean, it really is incredible um, when you look at how much data the two departments share today. What we're talking about is enabling the, the sharing of that information, uh, taking a different approach from a data perspective so that we, we can eliminate redundancies, you know, increase efficiency, so it is a better experience for our military members. Thank you. Is that a three-year pro I mean, three project or a ten-year project? I, I don't think it's a I don't think it's a three-year project to be completed, uh, but I do think that um, there are um, again phases of implementation we will be able to achieve in terms of the data standards. There are already international um, health data standards out there. Um, DOD has already enabled standardization within our own enterprise. Um, it's aligning with VA. I don't see that as a, a certainly not a 10 year. So I actually think that we'll be able to achieve some of that interoperability much sooner than the 10 year mark. Um, so I, I, I do think that uh, there are some opportunities in the n near ish term, um, be, uh, near being relative, to, uh, to achieve greater interoperability than we have today. Um, as as you all know, uh, one of the provisions of last year's bill was to provide the department some rapid acquisition authority 
Um, I think maybe you both make reference to it in your written statements, but, but can you uh, update us on where that is? Is it being used? Have we gotten far enough to know whether you, it's the kind of authority you need? Um, so I, I can start, and certainly Ms. Tikai can um, <coughs> um, add uh, onto my initial comments. The, um, uh, we have established, as, as the lead for the IT Acquisition Task Force in the department, certainly working very closely with uh, Ms. Tikai's office and our Acquisition Technology and Logistics uh, organization. And, and frankly, every organization, it seems like, within the department, from a test and evaluation to the comptroller, because we are all somehow involved in enabling delivery of capabilities with regard to our acquisition process. We have established many um, work groups focused on very specific areas like measures, m metrics, what are you know, leading indicators when, when, when that we should be looking for and things are uh, um, in a particular program to ensure that we achieve better outcomes. Uh, combining the certification and accreditation for testing uh, with the regular test process. Uh, typically, we treat them separately, and uh, they are not concurrent. They are sequential. Uh, so we are looking to take uh, that timeline significantly down. Uh, taking a much more portfolio management approach to overseeing these IT investments so that we're not just looking at one system at a time. We're looking at how does this one particular system fit within the broad portfolio uh, within which it will be deployed, but also you know, what other systems do we have that also utilize that same capability? How many financial systems do we really need? Um, so you can look at it from a functional perspective and also within an operating environment. Uh, requirements, I think I mentioned, uh, every study says that uh, we don't baseline the requirements, we don't hold them stable. Um, and so we're ensuring that when we pursue um, a new IT solution that the requirements are small enough that you can deliver them more rapidly in a 12 to 18 month time frame. Typically we put all the requirements in one big bucket and, and it's five years before we hit our initial operational capability. And so in order to make that, uh, those time frames smaller, we need to uh, parse the requirements such that we're delivering incremental capability. Contracting is also an area that we're extremely focused on. Uh, I don't think there's anything uh, within uh, a FAR uh, Federal Acquisition Regulation rewrite that we need. Uh, I think we need to be more creative about how do we utilize the contracting aspects, um, uh, authorities that we currently have. But we need to contract differently than we currently do today. Um, on the one hand, some programs will be firm fixed price, but if you don't have your requirements nailed, uh, and definitized enough from fixed price is not the right way to go. Uh, but then time materials uh, does not seem like the best, um, most accountable way to also pursue an IT solution. So it's coming up with a, the balance. When, when should you use those types of contracting and, and understanding that um, not one size fits all. And then um, when the other very key is the IT acquisition workforce. Um, the Defense Acquisition University has a program management course down there. It's, it's uh, terrific, and I happen to be a graduate. Um, but they don't teach IT the way we um, procure IT today. These enterprise resourcing, enterprise resource planning uh, programs, systems capabilities didn't exist uh, previously. And so it's really putting a, a very fine point on our acquisition workforce to say, hey, IT today is very different from source lines of code and function point counts that we used to do, we're actually buying a lot more commercial off-the-shelf capability, ensuring that we've got the right credentials for, for those folks. Uh, we are taking a very much a piloting approach. In my written uh, testimony, I, I highlighted a um, an Air Force financial system called DEEMS, the <coughs> Defense Enterprise a uh, Accounting Management System. Uh, they, they, we did utilize some of these uh, different approaches to move their implementation significantly forward. Um, the, both Army and Air Force have um, uh, their integrated personnel and pay systems. Uh, we're looking at it, establishing their acquisition strategy aligned with these more streamlined capabilities. Same with the Joint Space Operations Center mission system and uh, the Navy's intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance capability. So we expect through the use of pilots, we'll learn more to ensure before we institute uh, our final policy, that we've actually tried it out a little bit uh, to see where we need to course correct and so we get some of that, um, I'll say, fact-based feedback uh, to ensure that we have policies that are in line with where we want to go. Mr. Kai, do you care? It, it seems to me that... Uh, 
having heard all that, it just seems very difficult for the department to keep up with the change in technology, the way technology changes, and with with the with the you know with, with all that has to to go on before a purchasing decision is made. So does that mean we're always going to be behind? Well, it doesn't always mean we're going to be behind. There's a qualified answer to that, if I could add to um, what Ms. McGrath was talking about. And let me add to that, in addition to the you know, many process changes that we've been working with her team on, um, we also believe that the efforts around um, streamlining and standardizing the technology we use are a critical part of being able to get innovative technologies in more quickly. Right now what we do is we reinvent in many cases cases the same technology platforms over and over again because we bring them in in separate instances for separate projects. Um, and so just as an example, um, you know, as we've been working together from the standpoint of business systems, if we can get standardized platforms, then it really does give Ms. McGrath an opportunity to build on those standard platforms and not have to worry about the technology coming in the door, but to be able to spend the money uh, and the resources on understanding what business processes have to ride on it. The second piece of that, though, is that if we can standardize and improve the security of our backbone, we can then look at more innovative technologies and not have to invent them all the way from the data center, the server, the network out, but rather look at how those innovative technologies can hook into our standard infrastructure. It gives us more flexibility in looking at those kinds of capabilities. Having said that, as we build that out, we will need to, as Mr. Grath mentions, look at shorter time frames for bringing these technologies in. Uh, we will need to look at our uh, testing and accreditation processes because that is one of the inhibitors that we are aware of today um, in terms of retesting platforms for every upgrade as opposed to recognizing that there are standard platforms and there is not the need to test. So. Some of those things are the things that we are looking at from an information assurance perspective in terms of the policies that we put out as well as the accreditation and testing that we do at DISA to, again, allow for bringing new technologies in, but at the same token making sure that when we do, we aren't increasing our risk from a security perspective. And, and I guess related to that, um, <laughs> What are, are your concerns about supply chain? Um, you know, in, in general, in cybersecurity, we hear more and more concern about so many pieces of hardware and software that are not made here, where com or, and, and certainly many components are not made here. But as, as, as you and, and Mr. West were talking, you know, we've, we've got soldiers on the field that are taking whatever they got out of their pocket to do their job or to communicate back home. That's got to create all sorts of uh, challenges for you in, in looking at the overall enterprise. We totally agree with you. And um, there are really two answers to the question you are asking about supply chain. Um, one of them is just an awareness of the issue that you have mentioned. And we have uh, two programs that we are working with um, NSA and also with our policy office. One of them is to actually look at the ground rules around um, the way that we bring the t we bring technology in and the and if you will background information that we gather on the companies that we purchase from. So that is a key part of what we do, and of course in that we are aided by um, you know, information that we get through our intelligence sources as well about those particular companies. The second thing from a supply chain perspective is to work with our defense industrial base, uh, and we have any number of programs um, that uh, Deputy Secretary Lynn has been really spearheading around how to work and share information effectively with our defense industrial base, because again, the supply chain problem isn't really just an issue of DOD. It really involves our key partners. But the other piece of that is to recognize that as we move forward, 
Um, and as there is uh, obviously a globalization um, and a dispersion of where the information uh, or rather the, the components from a hardware and software uh, standpoint come from, it is really to look at cybersecurity in that light, which is why we are focused not only on protecting at the perimeter, which has been a focus I think for everyone in terms of trying to prevent intrusions, to prevent invasions in your network. Um, and now what we are recognizing is that while that is still a deterrent, it is not a complete answer from a security perspective. And so we have to look more at the way that we are classifying our information, the way we are linking that to the identities of the individuals that can access it. So again, we have a second level of defense actually at the information level and that we are acknowledging that we will have some of these kinds of intrusions inside our network and we are prepared to handle them. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Langevin. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> One uh, last area that I wanted to talk about <coughs> is uh, the depth of, uh, uh, of DOD's bench in, in IT career fields. Uh, as Secretary Gates' uh, IT initiative has uh, realized uh, individuals assuming the, the new IT positions after efficiency implementation will require greater technical expertise and expertise to, uh, and, and experience to efficiently uh, maintain the Department's uh, IT needs across all the military uh, branches. In the fiscal year 2009 NDAA, uh, the, the committee directed DOD to look at uh, the feasibility of identifying and, uh, and re, uh, retraining, uh, for example, wounded uh, service members in information technology and other fields. So my question is, considering the challenges uh, recruiting a, a competent IT workforce, have you leveraged uh, any of those programs to help uh, build your, your workforce there? And is there um, more that uh, this committee can do to retain the skills and expertise of these wounded warriors to help meet our, our needs and for a for a trained IT workforce? Well, we have been moving forward uh, in terms of looking at uh, those individuals that are returning from theater, and particularly the Wounded Warriors Program, around the capability and making sure we have technology skills. But um, going forward, we will continue to, to be vigilant and need to be vigilant on this. And it, it, uh, while it involves, I think, um, as you mentioned, being sure that we are uh, retaining and training our workforce, it also is a focus for all of us in terms of making sure that we have enough professionals coming up uh, that are educated in cybersecurity and certainly educated in um, the sciences and the math. So uh, some of the things that we are doing in that regard is to participate in and encourage many of the cybersecurity programs that are focused on um, our high school students as well as our university students, uh, to get them interested at a very early age in a career uh, in the science and math, and particularly moving into cybersecurity. Um, that is something that my office is very heavily engaged in, something that the um, policy office is very much engaged in. So it is going to be a combination of retaining the workforce we have, being able to grow it, but also making sure that we have an influx of individuals that have those skills. Good. And, and let us let's not uh, uh, at all forget about our wounded warriors and see how you know, they might be incorporated into these, these job opportunities. I think that would be important. I am also glad to hear that you have a focus on uh, uh, bringing up the next generation, whether it is focusing on high school or college. I actually started uh, working with the Sands Institute. We created the Cybersecurity Challenge uh, at the high school level. Rhode Island, my state, my home state, was one of the three uh, of the of the pilot states that are that originally tested the program uh, with a few high schools in our state, and now we've kicked it off statewide. And it's amazing how talented these young people are. And uh, the cyber challenge sets up the different hurdles that they have to kind of work through and to test their skills. And and um, I think it hopefully thinks it gets them on a uh, the, the career path of thinking about a career path in, in cybersecurity. Yes, sir. And um, I. Just came, I think, as you may know, as uh, from the position of the CIO in California, and we were very much able to take advantage of that cybersecurity challenge program. And in fact, um, I think we're the first to institute the high school version of that program in order to be able to bring young people in and get them interested. Excellent, very good. Um, you know, if I could, just going back to um, <coughs> Congressman Thornberry's line of questioning, you talked about we talked about supply chain and. Um, 
uh, and such. I actually had Secretary Lynn in my office yesterday, and we were just we were actually talking about uh, the supply chain issue. We were also talking about working with the defense industrial base and 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 how do we best work with them on a voluntary basis to have to better secure their their own networks. Uh, and I just I was curious. Uh, when you, when you say you look at companies you're doing business with and you look at, so the, from a supply chain perspective, um, how far back do you, do you do, drill down with each of those companies? You know, the problem is not just the company that you're doing business with, but it's who they're doing business with and who, who they're doing business with. And, you know, since supply chain can, you know, cover a, a, a range of, of problems, um, you know, it's not just the initial companies, but where they're getting their products from as well. So how, I guess, how deep does that go? Well, the initial pilot that we did um, did not really, and I'm sure that Secretary Lynn mentioned to you, um, we were able to go down um, deep in some companies, um, but when we really looked at the level of resource that was needed to actually be able to do all of that research, we recognized that we will be able to do a certain amount through research, but in many ways it's not going to be the full answer to looking at how we do supply chain. Um, and that's really why we're taking now a step back from that. We know we have to do a certain level of that, but it's also going to be we're not going to be able to do all of the research. We're going to have to engage um, with our partners. And then lastly, we're going to have to have other ways of looking at how to defend, because I think your point's very well taken. Um, you, you really can't have enough resource to be able to go down to every last component. Um, and so you have to look at the uh, major components, but yet that doesn't give you the complete picture. So that's why we're looking at not only being able to do that kind of research, but also recognizing that um, when we have threats inside our network, we're going to have to be able to mitigate them. Fair enough. And the last area question, uh, question that I want to get into, something in addition to and very much tangential to cybersecurity is the uh, security of our of our military bases and critical infrastructure that supports our military bases. Uh, as you know, um, much of our critical infrastructure is owned and operated by the private sector. Uh, I'm becoming increasingly concerned about skater uh, skater attacks, in particular on critical infrastructure, particularly the electric grid. Our, our bases, uh, military bases around the, the country, so much rely on these the, these outside uh, uh, power grids for their own power, and I've I've been um, involved with uh, uh, reviewing uh, how uh, secure those, those bases. I've had the, the chiefs of the services before us, who, and and uh, have asked, you know, what their level of knowledge is on on this, and it's troubling to them uh, certainly as well. It, it, uh, our bases are not independent of the the power grid, so I know this is a bit outside your um, your area in particular, but it does relate to IT and and cyber. So in your work. Um, do you have anything to add and any awareness that you have on what we're doing to better secure our, our military bases in the event that something happens to critical infrastructure uh, off the base and, and how they would be affected? Well, let me add to the discussions. On, I know you have talked with Deputy Secretary Lynn about this. Um, one of the things that he's been spearheading is to work very closely with the Department of Homeland Security for exactly that reason. Because while clearly it is the Department of Homeland Security's responsibility to look at critical infrastructure as it relates to um, certainly the the um, the U.S. At the same token, it does affect our military operations in those cases. And so, what we're doing is to really work collaboratively with them around taking a look at those threats, um, being able to share information. I think, as you know, there's been close working relationship between Secretary Gates and Secretary Napolitano around the sharing of that information. And one of the things that we'll be moving forward on as part of um, what Secretary Lynn calls our enduring security framework is now to move more into a review of critical infrastructure protection. Um, including not only our power grid, but also taking a look at, you know, some emerging areas, particularly, for instance, with nuclear power. Very good. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Um, Secretary uh, Taki, um, three intelligence contractors. Uh, 
named H.B. Gary Federal Palantir Technologies and Berico Technologies um, have a proposal under the name um, Project or Team Themis. Are you familiar with uh, this proposal that uh, has been purportedly made by uh, those three firms, uh, all of which are defense uh, contractors? Um, are you aware of that proposal uh, that was leaked uh, from the H.B. Gary Federal emails, which would uh, offer the counterterrorism and intelligence um, techniques uh, to uh, prospective private parties, i.e., Bank of America, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, um, for use against uh, critics of those firms? Are you familiar with? Uh, with that uh, situation? No, sir, I am not familiar with that specific, uh, uh, that specific proposal. So, you know, we're happy to take that for the record and gather that information and be able to get back to you on it. Well, now, it's been uh, about two weeks. Uh, I requested that information. Um, uh, do you know what has happened to that request and whether or not uh, it's being complied with or there is an intent to uh, comply with it? No, sir, I don't have that information. I wouldn't want to give you something that was incorrect if we'll be, I'll make sure that my office takes a look at it and that we get right back to you on it. Now, uh, it's my understanding that uh, the firm H.B. Gary Federal um, had um, developed malicious software that allows users to monitor the networks and computers used by third parties. Uh, is that the kind of capability that um, they have provided to the Department of Defense? Again, sir, I'm not familiar with that company. So um, again, my staff will definitely get that information and get, make sure that we get right back to you. Yeah, if there is a misuse of properties of the federal government paid for by citizens uh, of the United States through their tax dollars, uh, i.e., tools to um, disrupt um, foreign intelligence, foreign terrorism, um, and if that technology is used on Americans, would that be a breach of the contract uh, between DOD and any particular uh, um, contractor? Are there provisions in, in the contracts that uh, prohibit such use? Again, I would need to go back and take a look at that specific instance and you get that agree. information back to you. You do agree that that is a problem, um, that uh, we should not use um, taxpayer-funded techniques on taxpayers who may disagree with a, a private uh, domestic uh, business entity? Well, we at DOD are concerned with any breach to our networks or any risk to the security of our information. And yes. we take that um, very seriously. Um, it's a major part of the way that we construct our technology. Uh, and so any breach of that type is of uh, paramount concern to us. Well, if the same technology used by the Department of Defense to protect its own uh, internal uh, security, cybersecurity uh, issues, if that technology were used to do the reverse to a private citizen of America, uh, that would need not be a proper use of uh, of the DOD um, uh, techniques, would it? Well, again, um, any breach and any malicious software or hardware or any breach to DOD information. Well, no, um, I'm not is talking about DOD important. information. I'm talking about DOD information 
being used against American citizens for the use of private entities. Again, I'm not familiar with any particular instances of that. Um, certainly, if there are areas that we can research and take a look at, and we'd be very happy to do that and get back to you. Well, again, I would like to request copies of any and all contracts between the Department of Defense and the three uh, subcontractors or the three contractors that I mentioned, H.B. Gary Federal, Palantir Technologies, and Barrico Technologies. Uh, would you be able to uh, provide me with that information and also the chairman of the committee? I don't have that information directly myself, but certainly, again, I'll have staff research that and we'll get back to you with an answer to that question. Well, I think it's a very important issue that I'm not planning on uh, sweeping under the rug. I want to I want to at least uh, get those contracts and, and uh, analyze them to determine whether or not uh, they have been used uh, or they have been breached. Um, so I need that information. Yes, sir. We'll, uh, again, we'll uh, have my staff research it and we'll get back to you with an answer. Thank you. Anything you can add, Ms. McGrath? Uh, no, I do not have um, my own self-familiarity with um, the proposal or nor the, those three companies. Certainly the contracts have uh, written in accordance with the Federal Acquisition Regulations and we would have to look at those scope and conditions of each one of those to ensure that uh, there was not a breach of contract. But I, don't, I do not see an issue with um, complying with your request to have copies of those contracts and I will ensure that uh, Ms. Takai has all the support she needs to get those. Well, Mr. Kai, I, I tell you, while I was asking you some questions out of the corner of my eye, I saw somebody come up and give you a, give you a note, and that's always uh, kind of arouses my curiosity. I won't ask you what's in it, but uh, I am um, concerned about this case and the way it's being swept under the rug. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, look, Mr. Conaway. Recognized for seven or eight minutes. Excuse me. Depends on how good your question. <laughs> exactly. Well, it's a low bar apparently. Uh, Ms. McGrath, thank you, Mr. Tucky, for being here. Um, Elizabeth, you talked to us about um, the impact that the um, uh, I'm blanking on the name the hundred billion hundred billion million dollar reprogramming uh, exercise that DOD went through to try to find a hundred billion and a million dollars in uh, monies that they would put other places within the system itself, what impact that had on the efforts to, to get Department of Defense's financial statements uh, audited? It, it, it so hurt, to, hurt, helped? To be, to, to be clear, the, the 100... The efficiency initiative. Right, whatever. the 100 billion yeah. efficiency initiative. Um, I think we all wish it was 100 million and not 100 billion. It was 100 uh, billion. I think it was right the first right, thing. Right. Um, the, um, I, I, the, the department, as, as the, certainly the members of this committee are well aware, uh, took an initiative at the, uh, with the Secretary Gates leading to look for efficiencies in all aspects of the, not only the way we do business, but what we are, what we are procuring, how we are procuring it, how we are organized, you know, are we positioned to be the most efficient and effective organization that we can be, and to look for opportunities to identify efficiencies. Right, but I, how, how did it... So, so how did it then... Uh, help or hurt? So I, I think that um, um, some of the l lasting impacts of the efficiency initiative, we, we won't know until we're actually realizing some of those efficiencies. We've identified the opportunities for those efficiencies. I can talk. Um, what so do you, let, me just, let me ask okay. the question this way. Do you right. have the accounting systems, internal control systems, and management systems in place to actually track that $100 billion and know that it went from one spot to the other? So we have the mechanism in place. Uh, we'll be led by uh, Secretary Lynn with uh, Mr. Hill, our comptroller, and myself um, looking at uh, and with the undersecretaries of the military departments leading the the data collection, if you will, um, for their organizations along with their CFOs to ensure that, uh, that we understand 
um, the um, I'll say how close we got to the efficiencies that we yeah. identified. So, well, uh, so from a systems perspective, I just I want to be clear. I think we have the governance structure in place uh, to ensure that we can accur accurately identify the efficiencies. Then why can't we audit that governance structure? So the some of the data collection that we will utilize uh, will not be a hundred percent. Uh, systems based. Uh, it will require a combination of both manual and um, IT, if you will, to enable the data collection. And I and I think that uh, that you're aware that from an auditability perspective, um, if you put people on a on a problem or initiative like auditability, you don't have a sustained process. And I th and the path the department is pursuing from for auditability is one of sustainment. Uh, so yeah, well, could I get you to, mm -hmm. maybe I can't put words in your mouth, so I'm doing a pretty poor job of it. If you had better systems in place, would there be less man hours required to manually track the $100 billion? Absolutely. Because if you're using man hours to put together one-time schedules that track that audit, that big nut, that's the least efficient way to do it. You get it done, and, and, and perhaps the numbers would be good. But if you had better systems that, that spoke, as you talk, end-to-end -end and across the systems and all those the buzzwords that, that the MBA guys who write these papers use currently, that current lexicon, um, would it be easier to do that $100 billion? Would it be easier to do the $78 billion in cuts in terms of trying to find those? Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, can you give us a, uh, a quick, because much of this auditability does rely around the purchase of systems, um, and we've, we've had these age-old issues of, you know, one branch likes one general ledger package and another branch likes a different one, and, and so can you talk to us about progress that you're making uh, in helping, uh, you know, one common HR system, one common fixed asset handling system, you know, those kinds of things in order to gain efficiencies? So or, or to do it the way an enterprise would do it versus standalone subsidiaries as, as an example of the business. So the the Defense Department is being as large and complex as it is. We have mul multiple systems that um, establish transactions uh, to then feed into the broader general ledger system. Uh, we are pursuing, I'll say, five main financial systems, one for each of the services and then a defense agency-wide initiative. Uh, we're also taking a standards-based approach to ensure we have commonality of data, the standard financial information structure, so that we can aggregate the information at the end of the day. But it's not just those financial systems, as you mentioned. It's the logistics systems. Right. It's the you know personnel systems. And again, ensuring that they have the financial standards in them so that when we feed from a transactional level up to the uh, the the right. financial, then, then we can aggregate the information. If the chairman would indulge me, You've got to have some system to track progress against that. Uh, we need to have oversight on the success of what you're doing. We're not going to do what you have to do. We're just simply asking you to do it. Um, and so perhaps offline uh, conversations about how you satisfy yourself as the person responsible or one of the folks responsible for making this happen, that you're on task, on time to make that 2017 deadline, which I think we all want to, which is systems in place that are sustainable, mm -hmm. uh, and oh, by the way, auditable and uh, and audited. So, thank yeah. you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, um, Mr. Kai. In in answering some of Mr. Langevin's questions a few minutes ago about some of the tools you were putting in place to prevent WikiLeaks-like things. One of the things you, you mentioned was a new tool to detect anomalies. Sure, surely there's uh, commercial products uh, very suited to that. I mean, every time you go overseas and use your visa card, you know, they call, for example. Yes, yeah, so the tool that we are looking at is a commercial product. Um, and what we're doing is testing the integration of that product with our host-based security system to ensure that, um, again, we have that integration. The second thing with any commercial tool is that we have to do a level of testing because the, um, the volume and the size of our implementations are generally larger than uh, what any of the tools are doing in the commercial space. So we always 
take a look and make sure that we have scalability in those tools. But in uh, this particular case, that tool is a uh, commercial off-the-shelf product, yes. Okay. You mentioned a few minutes ago as you know, $38 billion roughly in the accounts we're looking at, $2.8 billion, I think you said, for information assurance kinds of things. Is that enough? Well, we're looking at that. In fact, it's interesting that you would ask that question because Secretary Gates actually also asked us that same question as we were relating to him, the review of what we're doing uh, from an uh, uh, insider threat uh, mitigation standpoint. Um, certainly for the calendar year, we believe that that $2.8 billion will successfully allow us to implement the tools that I mentioned, as well as helping us to look at um, some of the emerging threats and what we need to do. I think one of the things that is important to note is that improving our security isn't totally in just what we spend under the cybersecurity label. Um, the things that we are doing around standardization of our infrastructure actually are all uh, if you will, cybersecurity investments, but are not labeled as such. So to some extent, when we talk about that spending, it, it isn't totally representative of everything we are doing. Yeah. Okay. Fair point. Fair point. Um, I guess if uh, you could. I think uh, we have run out of questions for the moment. Uh, thank you both for being here and uh, for, for answering questions on a wide variety of topics. We look forward to continuing to work with you both uh, towards the things you are trying to achieve. With that, the hearing is adjourned.